but hello and welcome. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon um, for Locust Project's fourth Legal Art Link webinar. My name is Alan Gins Ayers. I'm an attorney and I'm the director of the Legal Art Link program at Locust Project. Today's webinar is a little different from our previous webinars in that today's topic is not going to be directly related um, to COVID. So instead, today we'll be covering different types of intellectual property protection. And we're finding that um, now is a good time for artists to be able to take stock of their work and implement uh, new tools to better empower their careers. So just a bit of housekeeping, please make sure that you're on mute to minimize any feedback or background sounds. Um, and due to time constraints, I won't be taking uh, live audio questions during the presentation. Um, however, if a question does come up, you can utilize the chat function and ask any questions that you have there. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat and, um, and answer questions throughout the presentation. Otherwise, uh, time permitting, we will have a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And of course, if you have a particular matter that you'd like assistance with, you can always send me an email or submit a request um, to Legal Art Link after the webinar, and we'll provide you with the um, information about how to do that. All right, so just a little bit about Legal Art Link in case you're unfamiliar. Legal Art Link is a program provided under the umbrella of Locust Projects offerings that aims to empower artists by providing legal information and advice for specific issues and by educating artists and empowering them to take control of their careers. Normally, we offer legal assistance to members of Locust Projects. However, in order to support the community during this public health and economic crisis, we're waiving that membership fee for access to Legal Art Link through December 30th of this year, or December 31st of this year. So again, if you have a specific legal issue that you need assistance with, please don't hesitate to visit our website, um, locustprojects.org, and navigate to the Legal Art Link page where you can submit your issue. You can also send me an email at legallink at locustprojects.org, um, and we can direct you to the artist form from there. And of course, because this is a legal presentation, it does come with a disclaimer. Um, so I'm just going to read that here right now. So the materials and information provided during this webinar are for informational purposes only. They are not intended to provide a legal opinion or constitute legal advice, which must be tailored to the facts of a particular situation. Due to regular changes in law and agency policy, the information provided during this webinar may not contain the most up-to-date legal or other information. Use of and access to this webinar does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the provider. You should consult an attorney for legal advice relating to any particular issue or problem. All right, so we can go ahead and get into it. So as I mentioned, we're finding that many artists are taking this time right now to evaluate and organize their intellectual property protection. And this webinar is intended to give you an overview of different types of intellectual property so that you will have the information to evaluate what might apply to your work specifically and what steps you might want to consider to secure that protection. My hope is that you will come away from this webinar with some more tools in your pocket so that tomorrow or three months from now or a year from now or whatever it might be, you might be able to recognize what types of IP you may have claimed to and make informed and intentional decisions about possible steps to protect it. I'll start by describing what I mean when I say intellectual property. And to do that, we'll first take a step back and consider what property generally means. So I think generally we all understand that having property means that you own something. Um, but what does it mean to own something? So generally speaking, having title over property gives the owner enforceable rights over those assets. So for example, the right to use the asset or sell the asset or allow others to do so. And importantly, property owners also have the ability to ask courts to enforce those rights. So in defining intellectual property, it may be helpful to draw a contrast to other types of property. The term real property refers to property rights in land and improvements on land like houses and buildings and includes the right to possess, enjoy, and exclude others from those lands or improvements. 
personal property refers to physical movable possessions. So for example, the physical embodiment of um, the artwork that you create would be considered personal property. Intellectual property, on the other hand, refers to more theoretical or intangible items like creations, inventions, and information um, that the owner of that intellectual property has the exclusive rights over. So while the physical artwork you create can be considered personal property that someone could buy and then have title to, the underlying concept behind that artwork or the ability to replicate that artwork um, or, or to further sell it or display it publicly um, is your intellectual property. And it gives you certain uh, exclusive rights as the owner that don't relate to the physical embodiment thereof. So now we'll move on to the different types of intellectual property. The term intellectual property generally refers to four categories, and I'll cover them in the order of what I believe is increasing relevance to most artists. So these categories are trade secrets, which consists of information that confers a business advantage and for which reasonable efforts are made to keep that information secret. Patents, uh, which for, for our purposes are new and non-obvious, non-functional designs or useful inventions. Trademarks, which are brand names or logos or other identifiable features that identify the source of goods and services. And copyright, which covers creative works that are fixed in a perceivable form. So meaning they can't just exist theoretically or ephemerally. So again, this is the order that I believe is the increasing importance to artists. So we'll, we'll start with trade secrets and then we'll end with copyright, which should be the, the most um, applicable. So we'll start with trade secrets. Unlike other forms of intellectual property, trade secrets do not require disclosure um, and are not registered with any entity. So rather it's up to the owner of the trade secret to ensure its identification and secrecy. Also, unlike other forms of intellectual property, which uh, may be time limited, so the, the protection is, is limited um, in terms of how long it lasts, trade secret protection is available as long as the information is kept confidential. So the information that qualifies as a trade secret um, must be commercially valuable. So it must give a business advantage from its secrecy. Trade secrets can cover a wide variety of information, such as proprietary formulas and recipes. So think um, the Kentucky Fried Chicken secret blend of 11 herbs and spices, or the Coca-Cola recipe. Um, it can apply to systems, such as the Google search algorithm, um, or aggregated information, like client or vendor lists and pricing information. Trade secret law does not protect publicly available information, information capable of reverse engineering or independent discovery of the same information. Trade secret law exists for the purpose of protecting fair trade interests and providing remedies against business competitors who obtain secret information by illicit means. In order to qualify as a trade secret, there must be reasonable efforts to keep that information secret. So for artists, protectable trade secrets could include, for example, um, client or supplier information. If you have particular information that's not publicly available, that gives you a business advantage over um, other competitors in the market. Also, if you have maybe specific original methods to create your artwork that, that um, is new and original to you, um, that's not obvious or capable of reverse engineering by looking at the finished product, that might qualify as a trade secret as well. Or if you have, for example, an original or unique formula that you use to make the materials that you use to create your art, that could qualify as a trade secret as well. Um, in order to qualify, there must be reasonable efforts to keep that claimed information secret. So you can't just um, call it a secret. You have to actually take affirmative steps to ensure that it is kept so. While there is no uh, bright line rule of what these reasonable measures are and what is reasonable will vary 
um, depending on the facts of each situation. Measures can include confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements, marking documents and information as confidential, limiting access to information um, that constitutes trade secrets to people who need to know, and also limiting where they can access the material. So say for example, if you have a specific method that you're using to create um, your, your work and you have, um, say for example, a manual on how to, how to do that, not allowing you know an assistant or somebody who's helping you to create the art to take that manual with them so keeping limiting the the um the confines of where people can access this information could be a a, a reasonable measure used to protect it um, and training employees who handle confidential information so all of those are examples of measures that could be um, considered reasonable under the circumstances to protect trade secrets. If someone uses your trade secret or improperly discloses the information, you may have a claim for a trade secret misappropriation, in which case you could sue that person who is using your information. If you're found to have a valid trade secret, you can ask the court for an injunction which is an order to stop the person from using or disclosing the information. Or if you're economically harmed, you can ask the court for money damages in the amount of harm or a royalty amount. If the person who misappropriated the information acted maliciously or willfully, the court may also grant punitive damages. So takeaways from uh, the, this category of trade secrets. Trade secret law can be used to protect confidential, confidential information that gives you a competitive edge. While you don't have to register the trade secret to have protection, you do have to take affirmative steps to keep that information secret. So it's really important that if you have information in your practice that you believe qualifies as a trade secret and that it is giving you a business advantage by virtue of it being secret and it can't be discovered um, by legitimate means. And so if, if you have that information in your practice, it's important that you affirmative, affirmatively and intentionally put into place measures that keep that information secret. Confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements may not be sufficient by themselves, but they are a very important tool. So. You know, if you if you if you're hearing this and you're you're thinking about some practices that you might have that can qualify as trade secrets, feel free to reach out to Legal Art Link, um, and we can discuss with you um, what measures might be reasonable under your particular circumstances. All right, so that was trade secrets. Next, we'll move on to patents. Patents are government-granted, limited-term property interests for invention. So we'll break that down as we go on. But government granted, meaning um, the, you can only have a patent um, if you apply for one. So, and that's a, it's a, the United States Patent and Trademark Office that issues patents. Um, limited term, so uh, when a patent is granted, it's only granted for a certain number of years. Um, and after that, the, the protection no longer exists. Um, and property interest. So the property interest for patents um, is the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, selling, or importing the invention. Um, this limited monopoly is intended to incentivize and reward innovation. The United States operates under a first to file system, which means that even if someone invented the same creation first, the person who files the patent can exclude that first inventor. In order to receive a patent, the invention must be both new and non-obvious. So in this context, new means that the claimed features cannot have been described in a printed publication or have been in public use, on sale, or otherwise available to the public before the application is filed. Um, discovering whether this uh, exists, whether there, this newness uh, 
this newness aspect is met, a public art search needs to be conducted. So while a public art search could theoretically be done by an applicant, it's highly recommended to use a patent agent or patent attorney who's experienced in, in researching whether an invention has been created prior or whether the aspects that you're claiming um, ownership or invention to already exist and are therefore non-patentable. Um, and then as for non-obvious, in addition to the newness element, the invention cannot be merely an obvious or trivial adaptation of the pre-existing pre invention. There are three categories of patents, but really only two that would concern most artists. Um, design patents protect new, original, ornamental design for an article of manufacture. And we'll go into what that means um, when we talk about design patents specifically. Utility patents protect new and useful processes, machines, articles of manufacture, or compositions of matter for new and useful improvements on any of those. And then there are also um, patents for plants, which uh, we won't get into because it's probably not going to be relevant to many of you. So design patents. Design patents protect the way that an article of manufacture which is just a fancy way of saying a physical product looks. It can apply to the shape of the product, the surface ornamentation, or both. The protective design must be inseparable from the article of manufacture. So it can't cover patterns or graphics that might appear on products, although depending on the way that those are used, they might be covered by trademark law or by copyright law. Some examples of a design patent are the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, um, the Eames chair, or the specific design of tread on tires. Protection for design patents lasts for 15 years from the date of the grant, and application fees range from $240 to $960 um, based on the size of the entity that's applying for patent protection and that does not include attorney fees. Utility patents, on the other hand, so design patents protect the way an object looks. Utility patents protect the way an object works. So utility patents are generally the kind of patent that people think of when they consider patent protection and inventions. Utility patents can also apply to processes or compositions of matter, so um, you know, different kinds of chemical compositions, but for artists, we'll, we'll most likely um, be talking about utility patents as applied to products or um, useful tools. Utility patents receive protection from for 20 years from the date of filing, and filing fees for utility patents can range from about $350 to over $1,420 based on the size of the entity, and again, that does not include attorneys. As I mentioned before, in order to receive patent protection, you have to apply to the United States Patent Trademark Office. The patent um, application process involves a review of the prior art. So all the previous in inventions, anything that's been in the public offered for sale um, up until the point of the application. Um, that has to be searched through to make sure that the, the invention for which you're claiming patent protection is actually new. Um, so it does involve that, that robust review of prior art to make sure that the invention qualifies for protection as a new invention. And the application involves um, preparing the documents and technical drawings to specify what you're claiming. This application is highly technical, so it's definitely recommended to use a patent agent or patent attorney in order to prosecute the patent which means to apply for its protection with the USPTO. Because of this, patent protection can be extremely expensive. About $5,000 to $10,000 per patent after attorney's fees. Once a patent is registered, the owner can use the registered patent mark, which is that circle P mark, um, to denote that there is a patent protection. The term patent pending, which you might see, is used for provisional patent applications, 
which don't get reviewed, but it does hold the, um, the date of the patent for one year. Um, so when, when the, the um, official patent application is filed, it gets dated back to that one year provisional patent application. And that's what that term patent pending means. Patent infringement occurs when someone makes, uses, offers for sale, sells, or imports a patented invention without permission. So going back, patent protection provides the owner with the right to exclude people from doing these things. So when somebody does those things without the permission of the patent owner, that's patent infringement. In a patent infringement lawsuit, the patent owner can seek an injunction which again means um, the court can prevent the continued infringement. It means you know, stop infringing this patent. Monetary damages amounting to lost profits or a reasonable royalty. If the infringement was willful, the owner can seek uh, treble damages, which means three times the amount of um, the actual damages. Attorney's fees, meaning the infringer has to pay for the owner's legal fees if the infringement is found. And the seizure and destruction of the infringing goods. All right, so takeaways for patents. Um, so coming out of this presentation, you should remember that you can obtain patent protection for new and useful inventions, so that's a utility patent, or new non-functional designs, so that's the design patent, in order to prevent others from marketing the same items for a limited amount of time. That's what um, patent protection would give you. You only have protection if you file a patent with the USPTO. Obtaining patent protection can be very expensive and you probably need the assistance of a specialized attorney. So moving on to trademarks. The term trademark refers to words symbols, or other perceivable features that identify the source of goods and services. So generally, we think brand names or logos, which tell you who is selling an item, but it, I put perceivable features in there because it can also be um, another aspect of this marketed good. So for example, famously, um, uh, the designer brand shoe Christian Louboutin asserted trademark rights over the red sole that they have. So the reason that they have trademark protection over that is because consumers understand this red sole to indicate that these shoes are coming from this source. Technically, the term trademark refers to goods only and service mark refers to services. However, I will be using the term trademark just generally to cover both. In order to um, be a trademark, the mark must be used for the purposes of designating the source of a good or service and not purely for ornamentation or decoration. So say for example, you know, there's, um, you're selling clothing that has a, um, a brand name printed on it, that it could be that that is seen as ornamentation and not being used to designate the source. So when you're looking at source designation, you're looking at more things like tags showing a brand name or um, maybe like a small logo. I, I know there's been some assertion for stitching on jeans um, to, to show a certain designation of origin. So it's, it's kind of a subtle distinction between what's purely ornamentation and what is conveying a message to consumers that this good or this product or this service is coming from this source. So the things that, that brands consistently use to the exclusion of others in order to designate the goods as their own, those would be um, trademarks rather than ornamentation. Um, while trademark law grants property rights to its owner, the purpose of the law, so the reason behind giving these grants of rights to the businesses is to protect consumers by allowing businesses to amass goodwill for their mark. So, you know, if you buy um, something from a certain brand, you know the quality of that brand and somebody else can't come in and start selling under the same brand and take advantage 
of that quality, that goodwill that the that the previous brand has built up to um, the detriment of consumers. So that's really the reasoning behind trademark law. Trademark law is covered by a variety of mechanisms, which include common law as well as state and federal registration. So again, trademarks refer to um, identifiable features that distinguish um, or designate a, a good or service as coming from, from someone or something in particular. Um, so a designation of source can only be a trademark if it can distinguish that particular good or service um, from those being offered by others. So um, to evaluate this, trademark law is sort of this spectrum of strength of marks. Um, that are listed here. And so going from the bottom of this list, um, generic. So a generic mark would be something that just is the term for, for what it is being used to identify. Um, so an example of that would be you can't have a trademark and sell milk under the brand name milk because you can't, that, that it wouldn't make sense to be able to exclude other vendors of milk from using the term milk. Um, sometimes trademarks that, that were previously distinctive can become so well known um, that they become generic and are in or in danger of becoming generic. So they can lose that trademark status. They can lose that protected status by not being distinctive anymore. So for example, the term escalator was at one time a trademark, but it became so ubiquitous that you know, the t no one uses the term moving staircase, everyone just calls it an escalator. So now that term's generic. Or um, Xerox, when Xerox came out, it became so well known that it, the, the term Xerox just became, um, you know, copying or uh, Band-Aid. So you'll, you'll see that, that um, Band-Aid is, is making a, a big effort to avoid a gen um, the genericization of its mark. Um, so I, I noticed in, in commercials for Band-Aids, it'll always say Band-Aid brand now. So they want to, they're asserting that it's a brand name and not the name for the thing itself, not the generic term for an adhesive bandage. When these um, previously trademarked terms become gen generic, it's called genericide, when they lose that um, protected trademark status. So next after generic, we, there are um, descriptive marks. So descriptive, descriptive marks describe the good or service that they're used um, to designate. They're generally not capable of protection because you want other, um, other people in the market to be able to describe similar goods or services. However, um, if a descriptive mark requires secondary meaning, meaning that consumers see this mark and understand it to be this specific um, origin, this specific source of origin, um, then it, and it can become distinctive um, and in that case become a protectable trademark. Suggestive marks merely um, suggest a quality of the good or service, but don't outright describe it. So think, for example, Netflix um, or legal art link. And um, fanciful and arbitrary marks are the strongest. They, so they're considered to be very distinctive. Um, fanciful marks are made up words like Pepsi. Um, and arbitrary marks use an unrelated mark or unrelated term for good or services they designate. So think Apple for computers and electronics. Um, Apple is a generic term, but it, you know, is, is usually not um, used to describe electronic products. So the use of Apple in the electronic space is considered arbitrary or locust project. So protection for distinctive marks used in commerce can be acquired without registration under common law rights through actual use in commerce within a geographic area. So that means if you are operating um, in the market 
and using a term to, to designate the goods or services that you are selling as coming from a particular source, you are gaining common law trademark rights in that designation. So for example, if you're using an artist name or if you have a brand to designate the source of your work and um, or you're marketing and selling that work, say for example, you have, um, maybe you're a, a jewelry maker and you have a, a store on Etsy and um, you have a brand name for that store and you're using that brand to designate that all of these pieces of jewelry are coming from your store. You have trademark rights in that brand. So even if someone comes later and registers the same mark, if you used it first, they can't prevent you from using that mark and you might be able to prevent them from using the mark in the um, geographical areas where you've gained those rights. Under common law rights, you can use the TM symbol in conjunction with your mark to indicate that you're claiming your trademark rights in that mark. And um, finally, the use of a, a name as a business name doesn't necessarily or automatically create trademark rights. In order to have the trademark rights, you have to be using the mark to designate the source or origin of goods and services. So, you know, using the mark to add to affix to, to any goods you're selling or making sure that the services that you're providing are being marketed with, with this mark, with this brand, with this logo is really important in terms of establishing um, and asserting your trademark rights. States also allow registration of trademarks and provide protection within those states and borders. So for example, in Florida, we have a um, state trademark registration which provides uh, rights for five year periods for a fee of $87.50 per class. So trademarks are generally registered per class, which means per category of goods. In addition to state registration, there's also federal registration of trademarks. While it's not required in order to have some level of protection, again, you, you do get trade uh, common law trademark rights just by um, using the mark in commerce. Um, federal registration does offer um, the widest benefits. There are several benefits that come with registering um, a federal trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. First is the presumption of ownership and exclusive right to use the mark nationwide. Um, that doesn't mean it's automatic. So again, if somebody has common law rights that are older than the trademark registration, they um, can assert those rights and overcome this presumption, but um, registration does allow a presumption um, of exclusive right to use. Public notice of ownership of the mark. So if anyone looks up um, the mark, they can see that, that it's owned, that it's registered. Listing in the USPTO database. Um, you can record the mark with customs in order to prevent importation of infringing goods. Only registered marks can use the, that circle R designation. Um, so when you see circle R as opposed to TM, that means that the work or that means that the mark is registered with the United States Patent Trademark Office. Um, Federal registration allows you to bring an infringement action in federal court, whereas common law trademark rights um, and state registration would be in state court. Um, and you, United States registration can act as the basis for foreign registration if you're using your mark overseas as well. To obtain federal registration, you can do so using the USPTO's trademark electronic application system. While you can apply yourself, I definitely recommend consulting with an attorney to make sure you file for protection in the, in the correct classes um, or categories of trademark use. You register per class or category of goods, which include, for example, clothing, toys and sporting goods, and entertainment services. This is just three examples of um, many, many classes that exist. And the filing fee is 225 
to 275, depending on the type of application, per class. Um, the length of protection can be indefinite. So unlike patent, um, which was limited in time, and unlike copyright, which we'll discuss next, the length of protection in a trademark can be indefinite. So, you know, think about these brands that have been around for hundreds of years. They've maintained their, um, their trademark and their right to exclude others from using those brands. But in order to keep protection, um, there are maintenance uh, filings that are required for the USPTO to affirm the continuous use um, and to, uh, and there's fees, of course, um, to file those maintenance documents. So if you, if you stop using a brand, you can, you can stop having trademark protection. In order to, to continue the federal trademark protection, the use has to be continuous. Trademarks can be abandoned if they're not continually used. So trademark infringement is what happens when someone uses a mark or a similar mark, um, which would be likely to cause consumer confusion about the source of a good or service. If a trademark is infringed, the uh, owner can ask the court for an injunction, which again, asking the court to, to order the infringer to stop infringing, um, money damages, and in exceptional cases for egregious infringement, can ask for attorney's fees as well. So takeaways for trademark law, trademarks are useful when you have a specific name or logo you use to identify goods and services that you market. So again, if you have, if you, if you have an online store, if you're selling, um, if you're affixing a logo or a brand to the things that you are selling in the marketplace, Trademark law might be something that you want to consider, and um, it might be good to consider what rights you have already, what rights you might want to establish um, through state registration, and what rights you might want to establish through federal registration. Uh, trademark ownership gives you the ability to prevent others from using the same or similar marks in a confusing manner. And you can obtain rights, again, you can obtain rights through use but registration may confer additional benefits that you want to consider, depending on the way that you're using these marks. And finally, we'll talk about copyright, which is um, the type of intellectual property protection that is going to be the most applicable to artists because it generally covers all kinds of art that are created. So copyright is a type of intellectual property that is granted to creators of works of authorship. And works of authorship is defined in the Copyright Act um, as these categories. So we have visual art, which applies to paintings, uh, photographs, sculptures, literary works. So um, books, plays, um, even software source code is covered under copyright literary works. Sound recordings. Um, which are the em embodiment. So I'm, I'm actually missing one here. Musical compositions should come before sound recordings. Musical compositions are the, um, the, the composition of a song. So the underlying um, composition of a musical work and a sound recording is a particular recording of that work. Um, Audiovisual works. So you know, movies, documentaries, commercials, Dramatic works, so um, you know, plays and pantomimes, choreographic works, dances, um, and other choreography, and architectural works, which are architectural blueprints. The grant of copyright is intended to incentivize creative expression by giving authors a um, by giving authors a limited monopoly on the on their, their work for their life, plus an additional 70 years. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Can you comment about copyright on an image of a work versus the painting in context with like a collector versus artist print rights? Okay, so um, I believe this question is asking about copyright in the underlying work versus the object itself. So 
as we talked about at the beginning, was sort of intellectual property versus personal property. Um, right to the copyright is separable from the physical embodiment of that work. So uh, a copyright in um, the, the work behind a painting is separate from the painting itself. Selling the painting gives the, the owner of the painting the ability to, um, to use that painting, to, to sell it themselves, to, dis to display it for their personal use, but it doesn't give them the right to create reproductions of that painting, to create, um, you know, to, to, to market it, and, um, and, and otherwise exploit the intellectual property. But it's actually, I think it's easier to understand that distinction um, if we think about, for example, um, the books that we have. So if I buy a book from the store, because people understand this for some reason a little bit better than visual art, if I buy a book, I own the copy of that book. I don't have the right to, you know, read to to read that book, um, to, to on like a, to make a recording of the whole book and and um, distribute that. I don't have the right to make copies of the book and give it to everybody, but I have the right to resell that that book, that copy that I purchased. I have the right to use that to consume the book myself, um, but I don't have the underlying rights to the copyright. Um, so again, so copyright comes with these exclusive works, which I sort of just mentioned some of them, but the exclusive works are um, the right to copy the work, so to make copies of it, to distribute the work through sales um, or otherwise, or licensing or um, other ways to distribute the ownership. Um, to perform and publicly display, and to perform and to display the work publicly, um, to make derivative works, which are adaptations based on the work. Copyright ownership exists once the work is created in a tangible means of expression. So that means once there is a physical embodiment of the work, copyright ownership exists at that point. Um, so for most of those works of authorship, this is going to be done automatically. For some things like music or dance, it's possible that a creation can exist without a tangible means of expression. So I'm a dancer. When we work in the studio, um, you know, the, our director, our choreographer is, um, you know, giving us movement and creating it. We remember it and then we do it until that work is um, embodied in something, until there's a notation of it, until there's a video of it, there's no copyright in it. So um, same with music. A composer could be creating a song that exists in their memory, um, but until it's written down or recorded, the copyright doesn't attach yet. For, for most other kinds of work, for writings, for um, visual art, that copyright is going to attach by virtue of the work's creation, but that's that's just not true for, for some of these other categories. Um, and then copyright protection lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. So again, copyright's intended to give this limited time monopoly on the work, on the, um, the creator's creations for their life and for the ability of their family and their heirs to capitalize on that creation as well. But after a certain amount of time, um, all of this copyrighted work is supposed to revert to the public domain so that everyone can use it. So, um, you know, the, at, at one point, this copyright duration was extended from the author's life plus 50 years to the author's life plus 70 years. So there was this sort of 20 year freeze where works weren't coming into the public domain. That ended a um, year or two ago. So now every year we will have um, you know, a whole year's worth of registered works that are coming into the public domain. Um, we're in the late 1920s now, in terms of when that work is coming back. Let's see, I think there was another chat, let me check. Oh. All right, so I wanna cover authorship. So this, this is going to determine who the initial owner of the copyright is. 
And copyright ownership initially belongs to the creator of the work. Um, and generally that's gonna be the person who makes it. In employment situations, it's a little bit different. So when an employee creates a work within the scope of their employment, then the employer is deemed to be the author of that work. For independent contracts, a work can be a work made for hire, but it has to be done so in a written agreement. Many contracts that we review, that um, we at Legal Art Link review for artists have this provision, have a work made for hire provision that um, some people don't notice. So they don't realize that they are giving um, their intellectual property ownership rights over by contract to the person who's hiring them. So it's, it's really important to, to keep an eye out for this term work made for hire um, or for any assignment provisions that might be in the contract that you're signing for your work. Um, and you know, it doesn't mean that you, you, you can't or you shouldn't do so, but just doing it with knowledge, doing it with adequate compensation is important. When there is more than one creator of a work and the, those creators intend their contributions to be jointly contained in the work, um, then absent any agreement to the contrary, these creators are considered joint authors and each can exercise the exclusive rights of ownership unless um, there's a contract that provides others. So if you collaborate, if you work with um, other creators to, to make your art, um, it's important to consider this aspect of copyright law and how it might affect the way that you're able to control what happens to this joint work vis-a-vis um, -vis your co-creator. So it's, um, you know, these are the default rules that exist, but it's always a good idea to, to have a contract ahead of time so that you um, can establish what you want your, um, your rights to, the, to that work to be. Um, so absent such a contract, that means that either author can sell, license, or otherwise use the work without the permission of the, um, of the other owner, although they do have to share any royalties or profits from that use. And again, you can contract around that, but that this is the default rule that's provided by joint authorship. Uh, registration. So while registration is not required in order to own a copyright, again, you own it once that pen hits paper, once the paintbrush hits the canvas, once you record your music or your dance. Um, However, registration does provide many important benefits. So registration is necessary in order to file a copyright infringement lawsuit. So it's not necessary to have a copyright, but if you want to enforce your copyright in the federal courts, you need to register that copyright. Registration is evidence that the copyright is valid. Um, and if you register the copyright, within three years of publication, so when the, the work is first um, sold, or first offered for sale, um, or before it's infringed, then you can be eligible, eligible for statutory damages, attorney's fees, and costs. And so this is a really important element that we'll, co that, um, we'll cover next when we talk about copyright infringement. Um, but the statutory damages can um, really be a big benefit for people asserting copyright ownership. And then registration also allows you to register the work with US Customs and Border Patrol in order to prevent the importation of infringing copies. How to register. So the Copyright Office also has an electronic registration system. Um, the fees for this are much lower than those, those fees that we saw for trademark and patents. So these are going to be about $45 to $65 per work, depending on you know, how many authors there are, what type of work it is, if it's just one work or several works. Um, so it's, it's a relatively low cost um, compared to the other types of intellectual property um, protection that you register for. And also, it's a one-time fee, and you um, it provides what I believe are really, really, really important um, protections or benefits in order to assert your copyright um, ownership in the event of, a, of an infringement. It's relatively easy to do on your own, so it's a relatively easy application compared to the trademark and especially compared to the patent application, but consultation with an attorney is still recommended. So copyright infringement. 
Copyright infringement occurs when somebody exercises one of the exclusive rights of copyright ownership without permission of the copyright owner. Um, and remedies for copyright infringement, again, include an injunction, so making them stop infringing, impounding and destruction of the infringing items. So if they've created multiple copies of um, your work, you can require them to, to hand those over and destroy them. Um, damages, and again, so here, here's the part where um, that timely registration really comes in. Because if you don't have that timely registration, you're gonna have to prove actual damages. Not only are you gonna have to register your copyright in order to bring this lawsuit, but once you register it, you're gonna have to prove actual damages. So what is the amount that you were harmed? Or what is the amount that they benefited from? Um, and that can be difficult to prove. It can be expensive to prove um, if you have to hire experts to evaluate, you know, fees and, and licensing fees and royalty fees if you don't have that information um, historically. But if you have that timely copyright registration, you can elect statutory damages, which is set out in, um, in the Copyright Act that for infringement, there can, um, there, there's a minimum damages of $750 up and up to $30,000 per infringement, or if it's willful, um, up to $150,000. So, you know, we might remember from the late 90s, early 2000s, there was, um, you know, famously a, a, a case for copyright infringement bought, brought um, by the music industry and a user of, you know, Napster, or LimeWire, or, or one of those services where for, for all of these songs, you get hit with a statutory infringement um, or statutory damages for each of those that each of those individual infringements really adds up. So it was a, it was a really, really large um, damages award for the um, downloading of all of these copyrighted um, sound recordings. And um, finally, the, the registration also allows um, the person to seek attorney's fees and costs, which can be really helpful in finding somebody to represent you because they know that they're going to be able to ask the court to um, to award their fees that that um, they've they've um, amassed by uh, taking on this representation. And finally, I just want to talk about fair use, which is a defense against copyright infringement. So going back, he said that copyright infringement was the exercise of um, the exclusive rights of copyright ownership. Well, sometimes. The, the exercise of those rights is what we call fair use. And this is um, the Copyright Act in the court's way to um, sort of mediate between um, the free speech concerns and the First Amendment with the um, protection of copyright. So it's intended to um, allow and to facilitate things like commentary, criticism, parody, news reporting, research and scholarship. Um, so sometimes if, depending on the way that um, a copyright is used, it could fall under this, this fair use designation, in which case it is going to be considered not infringement. However, in order to assert fair use, um, it is a defense to copyright infringement. So um, the, the copyright owner would sue first and then you would claim for you. So it can be an expensive um, thing to claim if you are the one claiming it. Um, and to determine whether there is for use, there's a four factor test, which um, is going to seem not that useful. Um, and I would argue that it is not that useful, but it is the, the test that is in the Copyright Act and that courts look at. They look at all of each of these four factors each time fair use is um, alleged. And so these four factors are the purpose and the character of the use of the allegedly infringing use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, um, the effect of the use in the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. So those are the four factors. But really what they're looking at is how transformative of this use or how transformative of the original work is this allegedly infringing use. Did you transform this 
underlying work so that your use constitutes commentary criticism parody are you is the is the first amendment um interest here achieved by your transformative use and that's that's really what a lot of these um fair use questions get to the heart of however you know fair use um jurisprudence is extremely inconsistent so you know if you look up fair use cases there might be a two seemingly identical cases that come out opposite because each time courts look at at these um, four factors and judges might might differ on, on how they're interpreting these. So it's really, really difficult to predict. So takeaways for copyright. So if you're making creative works, you're definitely a copyright owner. Um, check your contracts for clauses relating to ownership. Um, again, we, we see a lot of contracts where um, there's, a, there's a work made for hire provision or there's an assignment of copyright that artists don't necessarily know that they're um, agreeing to. So, so be really careful about um, the contracts that you're signing and, and intentional about the licensing that you're allowing for your intellectual property because this is you know, rights that you have just by virtue of creating. Um, and finally, while you don't need you don't need to register your copyright, um, you don't need to register your works with the Copyright Office in order to have ownership rights. Um, it can provide a lot of protection in the event of infringement, and it's relatively inexpensive compared to the other forms of um, registration. So that was just a, an overview of the four kinds of um, intellectual property that are available. Again, that's trademark or trade secrets, patents, trademarks, and copyright. I hope that gives you some idea um, of how to recognize what might be applicable to your practices and um, how you might take steps in order to protect those works um, going forward or even looking backward at, at what, what you own now. Um, I'm happy to answer questions either in the chat or um, out loud, or you can always email me. Um, again, that's my email, legal link at locustprojects.org. That's gonna go directly to me. Um, and again, we, we do have that artist form online as well. Um, you know, our, our fees are, are waived through the end of this year, so you do not need to become a member. Um, and happy to answer any questions about IP or if there's any other legal issue that you have, please, please, please reach out to, to us through this email or through our online form. Any questions? Oh, you're welcome, everyone. Oh, here's a question. Okay, does the trademark work for the artist's name itself or a graphic of the artist's name? So you can get a trademark for um, for words or for logos. Um, logos are going to be more. Um, it's going to be considered more distinctive um, because it's when we talked about those, those different forms of trademark, it's, it's more distinctive. So um, just one's name is considered to be um, descriptive or suggestive, depending on if there is um, secondary meaning attached to that name. Um, but if you have a particular um, logo or if you're using a name that's not your own name, if you're using sort of like a brand or an artist name or a stage name, um, that can provide trademark protection, but it does have to be used um, as a designation of um, the source of your goods or services. I hope that answers the question.
trademark on a character. Yeah, so characters are super interesting. They can be covered under um, a variety of, um, of types of IP. So again, trademark, it's important to, to um, remember that the use has to be that designating quality. It has to be designating the source of um, a good or service. Um, so sometimes copyright is, um, will we'll cover the artistic expression of um, that character. But if the character is used as a designation of origin, so think Mickey Mouse for Disney, that's like, you know, Mickey Mouse is used to designate that something is coming from Disney as a corporation, that's being used as a trademark rather than as a copyright. Um, looking at public domain items, does an artist have to keep track of what he or she uses as reference material, even if it's in public domain? So no, public domain, um, anything that's in the public domain is free to use. Um, it's good, it's good practice, um, I think to, you know, and it's, it's common practice in the, in the art field and in the education field to, um, you know, give credit to, to what's being used. But if it's, if it's truly in the public domain, that owner doesn't have any, they don't, there's no, um, they don't have a copyright claim to your use of that work. Um, if it is, um, you know, some, like if, you, if you're looking up, for example, on um, like Wikimedia Commons, a lot of the work on there is, is public domain, but a lot of it is Creative Commons licensing, which is not truly public domain. So if something's under Creative Commons, a Creative Commons license, it might have specific requirements in order to use it. So it might um, require, to, require you to attribute the author. It might limit the, um, the amount of changes that you can make on it. It might require you to issue the same um, license on anything that you create that incorporates um, that Creative Commons. So, so when you're searching um, public domain databases, um, do be sure that what you're using is um, public domain versus a limited um, copyright license. If we're registering copyrights and sound recording compositions where we have an unincorporated publishing company under pseudonym, should we register a pseudonym as a fictitious business name? So um, the copyright owner can be an individual, it can be a business, so, and um, the copyright owner can also assign their ownership interests to and from a business or to an individual. So it's, um, you know, it's not necessary um, to be either. Um, you can register in your own name. Um, or if you're, um, if you have a business, you can register under the business name. But um, if, if if it's unincorporated, I would say register your, probably better off registering your copyright um, under your, um, as, as an individual or creating a business entity. You're welcome. All right, there's no other um, questions. You can go ahead and um, let you all on with the rest of your day. Um, thank you all so much for joining me. I hope this is informative um, and gives you some, some tools that you can use going forward. If there's any other questions, again, please feel free to reach out. Um, always available to, to, to set up a time to speak further or to um, answer any questions or specific matters that you might have. Thanks so much, everyone and have a great rest of your day.